that I tripped out. And I said, God, what's going on here? And God said, look over there. And for some reason, I guess people didn't like rye bread and rolls. They were over there in thousands, okay? So you have to make adjustment. And here's another thing. You know what America doesn't eat? Fruit and vegetables. Because you could get as much fruit and vegetables as you wanted to. And here's the thing. What people don't understand is you should eat more fruit and vegetation than you should eat starches and protein and meat. You know what I'm saying? But people don't understand this. Anyway, during difficult times, God's people must maintain hope that the promises of God will remain true. He's going to look out for you, okay? You may, these things may not be there, but he's going to work it out to where you look over here, you look over there, and it's all good. You know what I'm saying? Then after that, you have to start planning ahead, you see? And think about it. And when you go to the store now, there's a lot of stuff they don't have. You know what I'm saying? So you have to plan ahead. Lesson context. Today's lesson continues the narrative of Ezra 6, 1 through 12. The resettled Jewish exiles under Zerubbabel's leadership rebuilt the foundation of the Jerusalem temple. After the work began, Persian officials questioned under whose authority they rebuilt. Persian king Darius responded and reiterated the declaration of King Cyrus. Only then were the exiles free to rebuild without uh, interference. Further, King Darius made allowances to support the reconstruction. The exiles were able to build a fit place for the Lord's worship. Humans often attach important significance to specific places. So it should be of no surprise that exiles would value the temple and its reconstruction. The temple mark were the place where God's presence was with his people. But if Israel were to disobey, then his presence would leave the temple. Ezekiel, remember how upset Ezekiel was because of the glory of God? And left the temple. See, listen, they don't understand. It wasn't about politics and everything like that. When the glory of God leaves the temple, this means God ain't with y'all no more. And all types of madness will go down. You know what I'm saying? So, and the reason God wasn't with them is because Moses then put down these specific laws and y'all just didn't take them seriously. And one thing we know about God, if you ask God for forgiveness, Bishop, will he forgive you? But Sandy, will you escape the consequences of what you've done? No, you will not. You know what I'm saying? Because he's a God of consequences. And he ain't just, just like your mom. Them used to say, I'm not telling you this stuff, you know, for my health or just to waste my breath. They're telling these things because they're important. And when you don't regard them, well, you're probably going to see some trouble. You just didn't have to see. And my favorite example is, if I'm walking down the railroad track and I see Sandy standing at the railroad track and get hit by the train, do I have to ask myself, if I step in front of the train, am I going to get hit too? You do not have to. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes you just need to take somebody else's example. And that's what I was saying about the world putting on a clinic about the things you should not do. Good morning. Construction of the temple was just the first step. The building had to be dedicated to signify its holiness before God. Previously, the temple of Solomon time underwent the same. Sacrifices were offered and God's people celebrated his goodness. The number one heading is called Obedient Dedication. It provides Ezra 6, 13 through 18. The A heading is called Leaders and Associates. It provides verse 13, which I would like you to read, Sandy. In the King James Version. Yeah, just let's just go on path. We we're not gonna go to that. Thank you, ma'am. Tat and I, the governor, oversaw the region on the west side of Euphrates. His patience is notable. He waited till Darius replied before responding to the reconstruction in full. Sheretha Bozni and their, oh, 
Uh, little is known about the companions who joined Pet and I and Sheta Bosna. They likely consisted of numerous groups of people. The leaders inquired of the Jews, reported to Darius, and received this report. Previous opposition to the exiles dissipated because of the patronage showing the king. Patronage was a so-called social economic relationship between a benefactor and a client, or somebody who is the conqueror and the conqueree. The benefactor provided materials and financial support for the client's needs. In return, the client pledged loyalty to the benefactor. In this example, Darius served as benefactor for the temple and provided reconstruction. In return, he hoped to quell any possible uprisings among the exiles. Okay, that reminds me of, remember when all the rioting with black people and all that first started? Then they start putting all this good money into the black community, you know, for all these different programs. And it was really a good deal. Then they would get with the black leaders, not send somebody white over there. You know what I'm saying? They would get with the black leaders and they would put black people in charge of community functions. That's the type of thing that you're supposed to do. Then we all say this is a good deal for all of us, you know what I'm saying? And so now we can self-police, you know what I'm saying? And that, that's what I used to say in the old days. In the old days, when a problem happened in the community, you did not call the police. You know why, Sin? Well, not only that, but see, when the police came, they would run a make on somebody in the crowd, and now somebody goes to jail that wasn't even involved. Now folk are mad at your family, and you really need the police. And like Sin said, they're not going to help. So this is why you go to the mothers and elders of the community and you work it out. You know what I'm saying? The beheading is called Elders, elders and Prophets. It rises verses 14 and 15, which I would like you to read both Sin. Thank you, ma'am. Oh, okay. Thank you, ma'am. Work on the temple reconstruction began in 536 BC. For a time, the work did stop due to opposition. However, it began in the second year of Darius, 520 BC. The repatriated exiles and the elders of the Jews prospered in their building efforts. However, their flourishing only occurred as they followed the exhortations of the prophets. In other words, the prophets had to tell them, wait a minute, y'all. Y'all have got here. Y'all have been freed. And the house of God is in ruins. Okay? If you ever want God to return, you have to set his house in order first. You know what I'm saying? And they didn't listen. And then things weren't going well. You know what I'm saying? So they finally did listen. Decades after the events of Ezra 6, Jerusalem's population was sparse. Eventually, 10% of the repatriated people, population, moved to Jerusalem. Still, the city was not a massive metropolis like other cities. Therefore, the prophets were likely familiar with each other and each other's teaching. Well, here's my thing. See, this is what happens. The prophets... Of the Bible, they all taught the same thing. They didn't have to know each other. You know what I'm saying? They didn't have to even like each other or have knowledge of each other. But see, when man come along, you got denominations, right? So we accept one thing, but we don't accept another. We do one thing, but we don't do another. Well, see, the Bible is not, you know, a, a country store. You don't pick and choose. You follow all the dictates. The prophets always did that. People never did. And what happens is if you have a church and people have enough disagreements, now you got two churches because they split. See what I'm saying? 
But that's a man thing. See, because if it's if you go strictly by the book, that's all you got to do. But you ain't got to come up with your own stuff, which everybody always likes to do. For a time, the exiles avoided work on rebuilding the temple. However, in August of 1520 B.C., Haggai the prophet urged rebuilding efforts. He didn't urge. He told him, y'all better do this. You know what I'm saying? Haggai's ex exhortation was not a one-time occurrence. Over the month that followed, he appealed to the people of Judah. He was most concerned with the glory of the temple and the actions of its priests. The first address of Zechariah came two months later. He warned the exiles repeating the past mistakes of their people. The mercy of the Lord was emphasized among the people. In response, they were to seek just and compassionate treatment of the community's vulnerable members. And see, let me tell you, that's how you could tell what God it is you should be hanging out with, okay? A God that tells you you need to take care of the vulnerable and the compassionate, you're not going to see any problem with that. You know what I'm saying? Okay? Because it's godly and it's thoughtful. Now, a God that tells you that if you strap on a bomb to yourself and walk into a crowd of folk that you don't know that they ain't never done nothing wrong to you and blow them up, that's not the God you want to follow. And listen, and then tells you he's going to reward you for doing that. You know what I'm saying? You can't depend on anything like that, but that's why you have to use your discernment in the things that you do. You know what I'm saying? And I'm like this. No matter who's preaching, you have to use your discernment. Now, it's like this. Have you ever rode with somebody who couldn't drive? Okay, here's my thing. If somebody can't drive, you need to play co-pilot because y'all may not make it to where y'all need to go. But now, when you ride with somebody and you see that everything is cool, you can... Imagination go out the window, thinking about what you're going to do tomorrow and everything like that. But if that person cannot drive, you, you better pay attention or and ain't either of y'all going to make it, okay? And my thing is, when you see that person in the pulpit can drive, you have to worry about it. You know what I'm saying? And their fruits will show where they're coming from. The year 516 marked the sixth year of the reign of Darius. The month of Adar marks the final month of the Jewish calendar. This month corresponds to late February or March. Seventy years after the temple was destroyed by the Babylonians, it was rebuilt. Furthermore, Adar marked an important time for the exiles remaining in Persia. The festival of Purim was celebrated in this month. Of course, that festival was established about 470 B.C., so uh, it didn't exist during the reign of Darius. Purim commemorated the deliverance of Jews from their enemies. Okay, and I'm not gonna work folk to death, so I'll read 16. The sea heading saw priests and exiles, rising 16 through 18. 16, and the children of Israel, the priests and the Levites, and the rest of the children of captivity, kept the dedication of his house with great joy. Acts of dedication were central throughout Israel's history. Large crowds of the children of Israel previously dedicated Solomon's temple. In similar manner, a crowd gathered to dedicate the rebuilt temple. The children of captivity acknowledged that the Lord doth build up Jerusalem. He gathered together the outcasts of Israel. 17 Sandy. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, so the commentator says the offered sacrifices were much smaller in number than those offered at the dedication of Solomon's temple. Does anybody know why that was? The, the commentary says the offered sacrifices were much smaller at this temple than the ones offered at the dedication of Solomon's temple. And why was that? Okay, what position did Solomon have? He was the king. 
Okay, so remember, when these type of things happen, it's supposed to come out of the king's treasury, okay? Well, if you online with God, you ain't going to squip on them, right? Remember, they sacrificed animal after animal after because they came out of the king. Now, don't get me wrong, Darius and them, you know, they love you now, okay? But you ain't they people. So when they gave you this, this, that, and the other, they thought they was doing good. But now, if they was worshipers of God, they done came short. See, and Solomon did not want to come short. That's why it was unequal numbers. Now, my thing is, and you think about today's terms, how much blood could that have been? Wasn't fun for somebody. You know what I'm saying? But still, these are the things that you were supposed to do. The discrepancy could be due to the fewer numbers of people, or perhaps the exile's poverty prohibited them from massing larger numbers, or maybe they didn't have deep pockets like Solomon did. The offerings were not chosen randomly, but consistent with the people's history. The law required bullocks, that would be bulls, to be offered during the burnt sacrifice. In addition, bulls were offered as part of the sin offering. A sacrifice of rams was required for the trespass offering. The peace offering, the sin offering, and the trespass offering all made allowances for lambs. The text of Ezra does not indicate where these specific offerings were made at the dedication. These animals were offered as Israel celebrated the blowing of trumpets. Also, when Israel dedicated the tabernacle, these animals were offered. The animals that were offered at the dedication of the rebuilt temple reflects two major points. First, it showed a concern to uphold the stipulations God required of the people. Secondly, the offer followed the precedent made by second, previous generations. Ritual purification and repentance were requirements for Israel to offer proper worship to God. Further, Israel saw no contradiction between repentance and joyfulness before the Lord. The repatriated patriated tribes experience joy as they offer sacrifice for God. And see, remember, there's people around here like Oprah and love the girl. She's great. But she say all roads lead to God. Not true. Okay? Because God have put in the Bible that there's a certain way you're supposed to come at him. You know what I'm saying? Okay, so don't get me wrong. There's churches down the street and if you see the way they're dressed, you know, but my thing is, but this is what they believe, so we can't put salt on their tail. Now, we're not coming that way. We're not coming to church in shorts, okay? We're not coming to church in sandals. And the whole idea is, if God offers his best to you, why are you coming to him like this? You know what I'm saying? Uh, you know, that's why the old folks used to call it, what kind of, cl what, 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 what kind of clothes? Sunday going to meet. See? You wore those clothes once a week. You don't wear those clothes every day. You only wore those clothes when you're going to church. And that's absolutely true. But see, as you are, it could get out there. It could get out there. Yeah, it, it can get out there. Right. 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 Absolutely. 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 Right. Or put it this way, you're not going with your shirts and sandals to, to work, are you? Right. That's right. 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 But what I'm saying is now we're not really putting salt on their tail because of the way they come. We just don't do that. Okay? Now they can come in because God did say come as you are. Okay? We just not gonna come as we are. All right. And see, this is what people loved about church uh, on Zoom. See, when you come and you gather, you got to brush teeth, you got to comb hair, you got to put clothes on. Zoom, you, people, you know, they dark, they dark out that picture for you can't see what's going on over there. You know what I'm saying? And they love that. But if it's something good, you got to go through steps. You know what I'm saying? Now, like I said, we're not putting salt on nobody else's tail. We're just talking about what we do. Okay. 
A sin offering of goats purified the temple, uh, the people of their sins and ritual violations. That the 12 were offered represent the split nation of the unified 12 tribes. As all are not the tribes returned from exile, the offering anticipated a reunited nation. During the exile, the Jews had been without proper accommodations to make sin offerings. The act of purification acknowledged decades of impure and sinful acts. As a new temple was dedicated, the people of God had a new start before God. 18. And they set the priests in their divisions and the Levites in their courses for the service of God, which is at Jerusalem, as is written in the book of Moses. A rebuilt temple required new labor force. The priests and Levites were tasked with care of the building, overseeing sacrificial rituals and service of God. The prescriptions for are found in parts of the book of Moses. And let's stop right there, okay? So, what did God say about when you're offering animals? They're supposed to be without what? Spot or blemish, right? See, and when we do things our own way, now we bring in animals that's coming up limping, they got one eye, you know what I'm saying, all this different thing. That's when you do things as you see fit. I'm not going to bring God this good animal. I'm going to bring him the one that I want to get rid of anyway. Probably was going to die, okay? No, that, that ain't how it works. Because I'm like this. When God, when you're in trouble, when you call on him, you want him there right away, Right? And that's why I tell people about their relationship with God. Be with him all the time. So that when you do get into trouble, you call on him. It don't seem strange to him. Because I know a lot of people in your family will say, you know, this, this blank only comes when he wants something. You know, call him all the time. Keep in contact with him. Because remember, your family is supposed to be your undergirding, your support. And when things happen, if your family is able to do what they should do, okay? But you can't just call them only when you need folk, okay? And that's what people have a tendency to do. The law of Moses set boundaries for the priests and Levites. However, their divisions and courses were established by King David. The renewed focus on worship highlighted the importance of the priesthood for, for Israel. Even in regard to physical health and well-being, the priests served God and Israel. 19, uh, Sandy. Thank you, ma'am. Beginning with this verse, the language of the text switches from Aramaic to Hebrew. This marks the transition and a new focus. Previously, the text was concerned with the dedication of the rebuilt temple. Now the text focuses on the religious practice of those once in captivity. A new focus reinforced Israel's distinctiveness, one that diminished their time in exile. The observation of the Passover gave space for remembrance. Israel was to remember God's deliverance from the nation of oppression in Egypt. Proper observation required that it begin on the 14th day of the month of Abib. Abib was the Canaanite name of the first month of the Hebrew religious calendar. During the exile, Israel adopted the Babylonian calendar system. As a result, the name of that month was changed to Nisan. I'd like you to read 20 cents. Okay, so when they were in Egypt, who killed the Passover? Nope. Because remember, they didn't have it like that. So, but they still was a group. Huh? Uh, yeah, but what did they call them? What, what did they call the leaders? Remember, because God said, okay, go and get the so-and-so of Israel because I'm going to free y'all. Starts with the E. Elders. The elders. See, remember, they was the ones that did this at first because they didn't have no priestly system and they hadn't kept uh, 
Remember, to be a priest, you had to be able to show this was your family line. Well, all that went south, okay? Other descriptions of the observance of the Passover do not mention the priests and the Levites. Instead, the elders of, uh, elders of the community of Israel selected and killed the Passover sacrifice. However, depictions from the time of King Hezekiah and Josiah describe a different story. In those cases, the Levites killed the Passover lamb for the people because of the uncleanness. The practice of Levites having to kill the sacrifice seems to continue. Okay, so remember some of the people were unclean. In the old days, if you were unclean and it came to the Passover, what did this mean? I mean, you didn't get to participate, okay? <laughs> Remember, if I'm not mistaken, it was Hezekiah. And because they wanted everyone to be involved, he prayed for them. God accepted that, and so even people who were unclean were able to eat the Passover. However, the pictures from the, uh, in those cases, the Levites killed the Passover for the lamb because of the uncleanness. 21. And the children of Israel, which will come out of Israel, which come out of captivity, and all such as separated themselves from the filthiness of the heathen of the land to seek the God of Israel, did eat. Okay, so what it is, this ain't saying this, that they was, wasn't unclean. What it is is say, okay, the people in the land that you in, who did they worship? Or can I say, what did they worship? That's a question, kids. Right, idols, right? Okay, so I'm like this. Now, I don't care what you got going on. If you're worshiping an idol, it would probably be a pretty good idea if you didn't eat the Passover, right? Okay. Because remember, that was a time where, see, now God waits to the end of time to get with you. See, but that was a time where if God had to, he'd come out on you right then, see. So not a good idea. Proper observance of the Passover required eating roasted ram, lambs, seasoned with bitter herbs and unleavened bread. Some of the meal's participants were those who had separated themselves unto them. This identification might refer to members of the northern kingdom of Israel or Israelites who did not experience exile. More likely, however, they were non-Israelites who chose to renounce the idolatry to seek the Lord of Israel. As long as they followed God's requirement, these individuals could eat. Distinctiveness as the people of God was most important to Israel. However, that did not imply blind patronism or nationalistic fervor. fervor, fervor, fervor. Non-Jews or Gentiles could participate in Israel's blessings. This occurred as they followed the stipulations God had for his people. The prophet Isaiah envisioned a future where this occurs. Gentiles were admitted as God's people when they observed the Sabbath and followed his requirements. Uh, B, and I would like you to read 22, uh, sin. Thank you, ma'am. The one-day celebration of Passover preceded a week-long observance of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Unleavened Bread. During this week, participants ate bread that was unleavened without yeast. This was to remember Israel's salvation rescue out of Egypt. And not only that, see, it takes time. Once you put yeast, it takes time. So they didn't have time. So they didn't have time to put the yeast in the bread, and they just had to get on. And that's why the bread was unleavened. The feast was not to be somber, but rather joyful. It reminded Israel of the ways the Lord had provided. The feast reminded the people how the Lord brought them out of the oppression of Egypt. For the exiles, the feast was even more timely. It reminded them of his provisions as they brought them out of exile. Okay, and then where it says, and turn the heart of King Assyria unto them. What is wrong with that picture, folks? Okay, I'll make it simple because we got to go before, before stuff happens and before the, 
before church starts. Okay. When folk went to Syria, did they ever come back? No. They never came back. Now, what did the king of Syria do for folk? He conquered them. Okay. And, but the real problem is when all this went down, the king of Assyria had been conquered by the Babylonians. So don't ask me why this is in the Bible, but the king of Assyria didn't do anything for anybody. So, but like I said, hey, listen. <laughs> yeah, you know, listen, sometimes stuff in the Bible is above us, and we, you know, we can note stuff now, but we just got to go with it, okay? This portion of the narrative reaches a dramatic conclusion as the Lord turned the heart of the king. As a result, new life would emerge in Israel. The once exiled people would increase in numbers, fulfilling the promises made to Abraham. The mention of Assyria is puzzling inclusion. The reign of the Assyrians ended almost a century prior to the descri described events of this text. While the Persians adopted aspects of the Assyrian government and culture, they were different for us altogether. The best explanation is that the text described the king in regard to remind readers of their history. Exile had begun with Assyria and the rule of its king. However, the God of Israel showed concern toward his people as he worked through pagan rulers. And see, this goes two ways, okay? Because remember when Nebuchadnezzar then came to the fork in the road? And didn't know which way to go? Okay? So do you remember what they did to determine it? They looked in the chicken livers. They looked. <laughs> they had a mess of chicken livers. You know what I'm saying? And they looked into the chicken livers for the chicken livers to tell them which way to go. Well, see, this was God's plan, so God provided an answer in those chicken livers. Okay? And send them the right way, because this is what they were supposed to do. So it shows that God has always worked through people who have not believed. In fact, what he said about Nebuchadnezzar, I'm going to let dude conquer everything, even though he don't believe in me. And then when God showed himself to Nebuchadnezzar and showed him how powerful he was, did Nebuchadnezzar start worshiping? No. You know what I'm saying? Well, well you can understand that because, see, his people didn't worship God, so, you know, as a leader, you got to do what the people do, okay? But if he sent to them changes where you've got feathers and beaks and claws and everybody else, it's, it's something you just ought to think about, you know what I'm saying? But what the heck? Conclusion. Building a joyful community. By 1942, the Gestapo had set down numerous underground seminaries, including, including Fiegenwald. War was in full swing in Europe. Bonhoeffer's former students were scattered around the continent. However, they were still faithful to their calling to serve the underground church. In an effort to encourage leaders, Bonhoeffer wrote a series of letters calling leaders to embrace joy. As suffering and difference become prevalent, finding joy was a challenge. And see, but that's the thing. They didn't say embrace happiness, okay? Because if you're embracing happiness and unhappy things are happening, you know what I'm saying? It's going to be hard for you to reconcile with that, see? But joy is the type of thing where we know God is in control. And listen, even if he don't control the situation in Ukraine, or he don't control the pandemic, or he don't control these things. He's gonna control what happens around you, around us. He's gonna put that hedge of protection around us to whatever's going on, it ain't gonna touch us. Like they said, a thousand may fall this way, 10,000, ain't nothing gonna touch you. You know what I'm saying? So that's what we really have to look into. The rebuilt temple was a result of God's provision and faithfulness toward his people. As a result, the exiles expressed their joyous worship and gratitude to God. These expressions took the form that had been prescribed to them. In other words, you're doing stuff the way you're supposed to do it. You know what I'm saying? If God tells you to worship in a certain way, if God tells you to pray in a certain way, if God tells you to conduct yourself in a certain way, it'd probably be a pretty good idea if you do that. 
know what I'm saying? Because remember, there are blessings for when you do right and vice versa. You know what I'm saying? Once again, the people could experience right relationship with God, a true cause for joy and celebration. Our community of faith may be driven to build new buildings, establish new programs, but our primary challenge when building is to respond joyfully. God's faithfulness to us demands such a response. From that foundation, we are called to build ministries as an outcoring of God's faithfulness. Ultimately, these become a sign for the world to see. So with that, I think we're just about done here. And uh, sin, we need to put you to work. Uh, we like when sin praises because she and baseball parlance touches all bases. So with that, we appreciate everyone that participates in Sunday school, whether it's in person or social media. And with that, Sunday school is dismissed. Oh, 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 listen, y'all. Yeah, yeah, okay, so.